is Bridget Van Monroy. I'm the director of APO. I would like to start by acknowledging the custodians of the land on which we're on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders. I would also like to acknowledge and respect the custodians of the lands across Australia on which our panellists and virtual attendees are on, their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage. Today we are discussing how research and lived experience are important inputs into the policy process. And I would like to acknowledge the value of First Nations knowledge, culture and experience, and that it's critical it drives policy and decisions that have impact upon First Nations people. Further, I believe it would be immensely beneficial if this knowledge informed all policies and decisions made in this country. So in terms of the discussion today, there will be time for Q&A and we'll be taking questions from those here in the room and online. For those online, you can ask questions via the Q&A box. Um, for those here in the room, the APO team will be roaming around with microphones and please wait until you have a microphone before you start speaking so those online can hear. Um, and please also introduce yourself. And for those in the room, it will be great if you can um, stay after the session and join us for refreshments um, that will be just over there. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending the event today. It's fantastic that we are here celebrating APO's 20th anniversary. This is a significant achievement in so many ways. The most notable are that APO is a digital platform and not and not many last 10 years, let alone 20 years. For perspective, Wikipedia was founded in 2001, APO in 2002, and MySpace in 2003. This is a significant achievement also because APO has remained a public good that champions open access without ever securing a long-term and ongoing source of funding. That's why we rely on donations, sponsorships, my APO Plus men memberships and building partnerships to curate and build engagement with policy and research. And we also rely on the dedication and commitment of the people who have worked for APO or volunteered their time over the last 20 years. And I would just like to acknowledge and thank the APO team, Camillo, Tim and Penelope, as well as the APO Advisory Board, including its chair, Professor Jane Farmer here at Swinburne University, who is cu currently on a well-deserved break. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our host, Professor Peter Shergold. I'm particularly delighted to do so, as Peter was the head of the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, where I first worked as a graduate public servant. Peter left an indelible mark on me due to his enthusiasm, willingness to banter with the smart Alex, but most of all, his eagerness to convey the importance of public servants' duty to provide frank and fearless advice. I'm, af I'm afraid to say that this was the first and only senior public servant I worked under who did so. Peter has an extraordinarily long list of achievements, so I'll just note that Peter is currently the Chancellor of Western Sydney University and he held the most senior position in Australian public service, head of Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet from 2003 to 2008. Over to you, Peter. Thank you so much, Bridget. I'm delighted to join you. And I'm very pleased to join you from the unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I have to say the provenance of that word Eora, as far as I can tell, translates most accurately as of this land, as when asked by colonists, the Aboriginal people of Port Jackson uh, responded, who, who, who are you? They responded, Eora, we are the people of this land. And it was colonists misunderstanding who thought that was a tribal group. So as part of those many of us who have come to this land since 1788. I do pay my respects to those who have been of this land for tens of thousands of years, our First Nations. I am really sorry not to be there in Melbourne in person, but
But as you may have picked up right now, I have a very bad cold. Not pandemic, but a very bad cold. And I have learned in these days of lingering pandemic, it is not a good thing to bring into a, a room of people. I have to say I'm honoured, honoured to be invited to chair this important event, celebrating 20 years of amazing achievement uh, by APO, 20 years promoting the extraordinary range of work that contributes to Australia's discourse on public policy. Whether it's royal commissions or government reports or parliamentary inquiries or research undertaken by universities or by think tanks, particularly, but not exclusively here in Australia. These projects are a fundamental part of Australian democracy. At a time, I think, <coughs> when democratic governance and its underlying liberal values are under attack from within and without, under attack from political populism, authoritarianism, autocracy, a rising tide of xenophobic nationalism, and in a time when conspiracy theories uh, roam the web, it's important to declare that democracy's greatest defense from arbitrary exercise of executive authority, democracy's greatest safeguard of citizen rights lies in freedom of speech and freedom of inquiry and freedom of civic engagement combined together with tolerance and respect in public discourse. And as in Australia, we witness rising levels of frustration with the processes of political decision-making. As we witness declining levels of trust in political leadership and political integrity, it is important to proclaim, to proclaim loudly, the value of policy design, delivery, and evaluation based upon evidence, including evidence of the extent to which policy decisions are not just effective, but equitable. And so with those challenges in mind, this anniversary function is, I think, an appropriate opportunity to talk about the positive role that can be played in disseminating, as APO does, in disseminating the diversity of evidence that exists to inform and then to test public policies. So today I'm fortunate to have a wonderful panel of four individuals uh, who contribute to public policy debate in many different ways. Uh, we have together a chance to discuss the whole concept of evidence and how our understanding of evidence is changing. Evidence as understood by commentators and advocates, by academics and activists, by public servants like Bridget and I were, as well as public lobbyists. I think we see, for example, an increased recognition that much expertise resides in the community-based organizations that deliver public policy on the front line. And I think we can acknowledge more openly that good evidence should be able to capture the lived experience of those who are likely to be the focus of government policies and programs and services and financial support. And we see, for instance, that instead of viewing the money spent on public policy as expenditure as a, a call upon tax generated consolidated revenue that evidence evidence on policy outcomes can be used to properly assess the value of that policy as spending on investment enabling proper cost benefit risk based approaches to policy design 
So it's these issues and others we now have an opportunity to explore in this hybrid in-person uh, online event. So let's begin. And I'm going to go, first of all, uh, to Brian Head. Uh, Brian is, uh, has lived a lifetime, I think, of both practice and of uh, research. Uh, he's not only contributed to evidence in public policy, but he has thought deeply about the nature and the influence of that evidence. Uh, Brian's uh, Professor of Policy and Evaluation at the University of Queensland, an institution which he joined some 15 years ago after holding other roles, both in government and with non-government uh, organizations. He's a well-published author, including books on wicked problems in public policy, and uh, learning policy, doing policy. Brian, I'd like to um, make, uh, to, to call upon, I suppose, the length of your involvement in this area. I was going to say an old hand, but I think that's not appropriate. Uh, the length of time you've been in this area, I'm interested if you look back, look back over the last 10, 20 years, uh, I wonder if you think that the character of the evidence produced to influence public policy has changed. And I suppose more personally, is the way that you, you, Brian, regard evidence now um, different from the way that you might have talked about it or thought about it 10 or 20 years ago? Uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm sorry that that's Thanks. always the first question for someone speaking remotely, so I apologise for that. Um, absolutely. I left government service in 2003, um, and I didn't immediately resume an academic career. I went to help set up um, uh, an NGO in Canberra that was multi-sectoral, and um, uh, this was the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, led by Fiona Stanley. And this opened my eyes to a significant extent to this sense in which uh, the government sector, the research sector and the NGO sector uh, were different, but needed to work together much better to cope with um, exploring and, and improving the major um, social and health issues of the day. And uh, Working with those people over three years uh, taught me a lot about um, the incredible depth of knowledge and understanding that was available through the NGO sector that was not really well understood either in the research sector or in many parts of government. So I then formulated my notion that uh, for policy, we need to take seriously and respectfully uh, a broader uh, view of what is valuable evidence um, the, the narrow kind of notion of evidence-based policy as privileging uh, research-based, particularly quantitative evidence, uh, seemed to be incapable of really getting very far in helping with the kinds of issues that we were trying to grapple with. So um, I started writing some things personally to just say, uh, let's get serious about uh, uh, evidence pluralism, if you like, and those sort of ideas I've been testing out in various forums for um, a long time since. I, I just mentioned in passing that um, I was at an international conference on Monday and they were all talking about the way in which everyone was moving away from uh, a narrow focus on, uh, if you like, scientific, rigorous, uh, uh, verifiable, experimental evidence as the epitome of good, of good knowledge. And that um, uh, this would be done perhaps in two main ways, which is to get to your point, Peter, that I think um, on, the, on the one hand, finding ways to communicate directly with people who are affected by programs or who are trying to develop uh, new ways of thinking about uh, a whole range of issues, whether it's in disability services, whether it's in uh, Indigenous self-determination, whatever the field, we absolutely have to find ways to um, enable uh, voice as directly as possible in the process. The other thing that my students ask me a lot is, uh, are there any process or procedural tools that can help us tap into these forms of evidence? 
And uh, I'm quite partial to well-run public inquiries, which call for submissions on key issues. I know that a lot of people uh, find that a bit cumbersome and laborious, but I think we've shown in, in a number of recent examples that uh, these provide a great platform for a very wide range of stakeholders to be engaged directly or indirectly through advocacy groups to state points of view which are otherwise um, unexplored. Um, and I just want to give a plug for something I've put into the chat room, which is uh, an example of uh, groups working together across the sectors. In this case, uh, a philanthropic group, the Churchill Trust, which sends public servants and others around the world to look at issues and come back with ideas for improving um, uh, an issue. Uh, we've been working with them for the last couple of years to help them develop some publications where uh, people go off and uh, in this particular document, for example, people working on um, substance abuse treatment for young people, uh, family advocacy issues and child protection, uh, cool burning in the bush to promote um, uh, regeneration and to avoid destructive wildfires. Um, uh, a number of other examples in this document which just show that public servants are really keen to learn from others and to um, plug into a range of different forms of knowledge which have very little to do with quantitative uh, experimental evidence. I might leave it there for now. So, Brian, just let me follow that up, though. I, I remember way back in the 60s and 70s, because I was an economic historian, there was, you know, enormous hope placed upon oral history. Uh, and I think over time, uh, people started to see the potential limits uh, of oral history and the dangers of it. Now, I know that term I really like that you're using is, you know, experiential forms of knowledge capture. But when you move away from what we used to think was evidence traditionally, do you think it involves additional risks and can they be handled? Yeah, that, that's a, I think that's one of the biggest questions um, at the moment. Um, I mean, I think, I think that uh, the, the meaningfulness, the veracity, the representativeness of oral evidence is something that we test out in quite practical ways in different forums. Um, you know, the so-called pub test, uh, but also courts of law, uh, royal commissions, uh, various kinds of public inquiries, which are trying to weave together um, uh, the, the different narratives and different interests coming from uh, various quarters. Uh, it, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, in the social sciences, uh, which many of us have been involved in, um, th this question of uh, how to how to do qualitative evidence gathering, uh, particularly from groups that um, are not used to uh, giving voice in sort of public forums, um, that's sort of like the number one question, I think. And yeah. uh, one of, the, one of the great things that um, APO has been doing is, is curating a lot of documents that uh, in very diverse ways bring together a lot of that material in a way that is um, intelligible and well communicated and no doubt very influential. As you said before, Peter, um, you know, having, having open sources of information is the best way to make sure that uh, interests are protected and that people have a good understanding of each other's point of view, without which we tend to just ride roughshod over, uh, over the powerless. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I always think that Royal Commissions, as an example, are brilliant in identifying, bringing witnesses uh, forward to give evidence, which is great. The things I think that often Royal Commissions struggle with is actually then how to interpret that what is its meaning what is its implication for public policy but that is not if you will a fault of the evidence itself um, i'm going to turn now to professor uh, jackie leach scully she's the director of the disability innovation institute at uh, unsw uh, and she's a person who has turned her expertise in molecular genetics and uh, psychoanalysis into a discipline that is at least new to me, uh, uh, called bioethics. Uh, but 
I have to say, Jackie is no uh, ivory tower academic. She's also a highly effective activist for disability rights. So Jackie, enlighten me, what exactly is bioethics and can it or does it, or indeed, is it intended uh, to influence the policy settings of governments? Bioethics is uh, a way of studying the ethical uh, implications and moral implications of biomedicine, of uh, life sciences, um, and those sorts of areas, and, and healthcare in general, not just healthcare, biological research as well. But broadly speaking, it's looking at the, the ethical consequences of those disciplines and fields and areas. Um, and so bioethicists who tend to be a very diverse bunch of people, we come in from law or um, science in my case, or social science or philosophy and so on, um, very often get involved in those activities in which somebody's trying to put a policy around a new biotechnology or governance of some kind uh, around a new uh, healthcare intervention uh, and so on, or public health intervention uh, and so on. So. It is intriguingly a, the sort of discipline in which you start at one end very often with some very basic science, sometimes even molecular science, and you can kind of join the dots all the way through to um, a policy um, and, and a public impact um, as well, which I think one of the things I find fascinating about it. So I know, I know that you set a, a, a high store on um, empirical research and, mm. and that can have practical and concrete outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I want to do what in your experience is the extent to which research can actually capture the life and experience mm -hmm. of people with disabilities, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've already addressed some of the, 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 you know, the issues that are there. In a discipline like bioethics or field of activity, let's say like bioethics, um, in one sense, almost anything you you can do empirically can kind of improve that input because the uh, bioethics has an unfortunate history of, of being uh, very abstract until quite recently. Um, for people with disability in particular, I think that's crucial because so much of, of medicine and biomedicine healthcare is in one way or another about disability. It's trying to prevent disability or cure it or alleviate it, or in some way make the lives of people with disability um, better, um, get more of a, an, a level playing field. Obviously that spills over to social care too. Um, and because of that, the, um, the, the importance of these highly diverse areas of experience because of you know, the highly diverse nature of disability um, of itself um, um, is it's, it's crucial. Um, until recently, there have also been relatively few bioethicists with lived experience of disability yeah. too, I and mean, I count myself as one, but there are a handful of others uh, across the world. And so we've relied on um, empirical research or experiential accounts uh, of that experience to inform some of the theoretical thinking and then inform some of the policy too. Um, that's sort of by way of saying it's important, you'll have seen that I've sidestepped your question more or less about how to do it, um, because it's difficult. Yeah, but I do remember when we were preparing for this, I was commenting that um, I think it's very good in universities mm. today to see there is a much greater acknowledgement and priority given to uh, translational research. And you said, well, that's not how mm. I would really describe mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I see myself as an intermediary. I'm curious, mm -hmm. what, what did you mean? Um, I suppose I, I was there at that point trying to avoid any implication that I do something which I think is people are rightly suspicious of now, um, which is the phrasing of giving voice to marginalized yeah. groups or minorities. Um, and I think what Brian said earlier is much more to that point to enable those voices um, to come through. Nevertheless, there are, you know, literally occasions when you're either, you know, you're writing a piece or you're in a room with policymakers and what you're talking about is the empirical evidence that you've acquired. So in my case, that will be um, having gone and interviewed people who are affected by a new 
by medical technology. Uh, in, in the early days of my career, that was something like IVF or genetic testing, and nowadays it's likely to be something much more esoteric. Um, but it, the, what I do remains the same, which is I go and talk to people and say, or listen to them rather, and say, what are the problems you're facing? Uh, what's, what's good about this? What's bad about this? Um, and the phrase I often use is turning what they say into something that's palatable to and comprehensible to whatever the audience on the other side is, which could be other bioethicists, or it can sometimes be policymakers. And by palatable, I don't mean turning it into something that is comfortable for them to hear, but putting it in terms that make sense to them and that they can make the most use of. I, th I think it's really interesting, this whole concept of, uh, and it runs through the social sciences and in now increasingly the liberal arts and mm. humanities of, you know, giving voice to other. I remember as, you know, as an economic historian, mm. one of my goals was to try mm. through what I wrote to give voice to mm. those in history who hadn't usually had one. But the mm. challenge, of course, in it's, it's full of risks because, as you're suggesting, uh, the person mm. who is doing that is, in effect, with the best of intentions, mm. often intermediating, your words, making palatable, you know, the voice of those with whom one is dealing. It, it's a great segue, uh, I think, to go to uh, the third of, a third of our guests, uh, uh, Roy, Roy R.C. Roy is a, a, a Wiradjuri man. He is a key member of the Uluru Dialogue Leadership Group. And uh, I noticed in the notes I had, he says, um, he's proud to say he's not a professor of anything, which is uh, why I think the voice he has today is really important. Rather, Roy has worked in government. Uh, he has worked in Aboriginal community controlled organisations. Uh, I, I would see him and I hope he would see himself as, you know, uh, both a political and a policy advocate. And of course, right now, most importantly, Roy is active in the campaign to give formal recognition to Indigenous voice so that we can hear voice directly and not intermediated through public servants like myself in the past, who were the CEO of AXIC and did our best, but they were nevertheless, in your words, Jackie, were, were intermediating. <laughs> so, um, Roy, I'm interested very much to get your views. Uh, you're clearly committed to bringing about changes to our political system, not just to influence you know, particular public policy outcomes. I'm curious about evidence, this word evidence you use. Does evidence uh, matter to you at all? And if so, what forms of evidence would you be looking to use? Thanks, Peter. That's where I've seen your name before, the CEO, former CEO of ATSI. Yeah, I'm trying to. I thought you were saying we were going to get you. Yeah, I'm trying to think now. Where have I seen that name before? I just want to, uh, as per protocol, I'm off my country, so that means I'm on someone else's country, and I'd like to pay the my my respects to the traditional custodians of this country, all the elders, both past and present, and equally as important, we shouldn't forget and mustn't forget our brothers and sisters who've gone before us. Because without their inspiration, aspiration and determination, I certainly wouldn't have the opportunities that I've got today. And uh, Peter, that's a great question. I, our people, we've been talking in, for, for time and memorial and the way we've communicated with our elders and our young people and our communities is through stories. Stories are so important. And I want to share with you a, a quick story that incorporates uh, a policy. And I want to thank Bridget as well for the opportunity to come and, and uh, share today in this, uh, you know, in this celebration of 20 years of the APO. I feel honoured and sometimes I question myself and say, why me? And one of my elders said to me, why not you? So uh, there was this... There was this young Aboriginal boy. He grew up on a reservation. He had five sisters and two brothers. His mother was a single parent. He didn't know who his father was, never met his father until he was 20. He went on the reservation, they had a little school. 
He went to that little school. It was just all Aboriginal kids, all Abri his cousins, the families that lived on that reservation. He swam in the river. He was taught to respect the land and the country, uh, the, the, the mountain ranges, uh, the beautiful smell of the pines, the, 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 the sound of all the wildlife that's coming from the, from the river that echoes along the river when he was sitting on the bank as a young boy with his family and friends. And so he went to the school and he started to, uh, you know, listen to this non-Aboriginal teacher who, was, who had a big influence on this young Aboriginal boy's life. And so he went to uh, sixth class at this school he had dreams, aspirations and goals, even though he looked across the road where his uncle was there with his, with the, his, uh, his wife and his cousins and, and he had that, that, that father role model. And this young Aboriginal boy started to question himself and thinking, well, where's, where's his father? If his uncle's there for them kids, how come... His father's not there to take him to his first day of school, not to be there when he, when he started to go to high school. So early on, early on, this young Aboriginal boy started question, questioning his, where, his existence. Why is he here? So he goes into high school and he tends, uh, he, he goes into a, an environment where there's, there's 400 non-Aboriginal people and it was a real cultural shock for this, for this young Aboriginal boy who lived on a reservation. And we want to talk about policies and the impact of policies. Let's not forget the legacy that some of these failed policies have left our people, like the segregation policy, like the assimilation policy, the child removal policy, where that you can have your kids taken away because of a policy. Policies, Peter, is really, really important especially when it impacts on future generations. So this young Aboriginal boy bucked against the system because, like Peter mentioned earlier, they started talking about 1788, whereas his uncles were talking about time in memorial. And so he started to learn about Captain Cook. And he's saying to himself, hang on, there's something wrong here. So this young Aboriginal boy bucked against the system because he questioned the system and said, well, hang on, you're telling me about this, but I'm going home and learning about, you know, uh, how, how my, this culture that's been alive for, you know, since seven, before 1788 that isn't talked about it in this education system. So in year nine, he, uh, he played up this young Aboriginal boy and he was told to leave school third form, you wouldn't amount to anything that they told him that he was just like the rest of them. And that young Aboriginal boy believed that. So he got himself into trouble. He mixed with the wrong crowds. Because another thing that, uh, that needs to be discussed in these policy debates is racism and institutional racism. Hence why we're trying to have a, our own voice enshrined in the constitution because our founding docu a document doesn't talk about us as, as First Nation people, only when they want to use powers, certain powers, to disempower First Nations people. So this young Aboriginal boy gets himself into all sorts of trouble, uh, uh, gets in trouble with the law, uh, finds himself on the wrong side of the law, experiments with drugs, alcohol, and two months after he turned 18, he wake up in prison. And he's looking at a long custodial sentence. And he was given a second chance. Then a guide comes into his life, which would be his uncle. And his uncle said to him, I know you." this young Aboriginal boy was a very angry man. And his uncle said, you got, that anger has to be turned into advocacy. The only way that change can be made is if you go out and get yourself educated he said to this young Aboriginal boy, and he used that. He said, non-Aboriginal people, they'll respect that paper and they mightn't respect you. So he, uh, he did that through Western Sydney, went to Western Sydney, got educated as a mature age student, and then doors started to open for him. 
And then he he uh, he applied for the uh, uh, there was a vacancy in the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. Uh, he put his hand up because he wanted to represent his people. He got elected by his peers. And then he went on to uh, be the chair of the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. He spoke four times at New York, at the United Nations in New York on behalf of all Aboriginal people in this country, and spoke twice in, in uh, Geneva at the United Nations. He went on to advise two prime ministers in this country. Not one of them listened, but he advised them. And that young Aboriginal boy is that he's sitting here today. And that is my story. Because that story is so, so important. Because my, my mother was put on a reservation because of the policy, a policy that discriminated against my people. And you're right, Peter, that's why I'm, I don't consider myself to be educated. And my uncle said, you don't have to be educated, son just be pissed off enough to change the system. And so I did. I turned that anger into advocacy. And that's what I tell my kids. You know, please, you know, be advocates, be positive advocates. So I just thought I'd, I'd share that. And it's, uh, I'm just so, so pleased to be here today to be able to share that with you because it's really, really important. Thank you, Roy. And in fact, that story, that wonderful, powerful uh, story is a brilliant segue to... Um, uh, our last uh, panelist, because of course, you know, we talk about whether we can incorporate effectively lived experience. Of course, the next thing which you're talking about is to what extent you can then contribute your own lived experience into policy. So I want to go to you, uh, Heidi, Heidi Everett. Heidi is the founder and chair of a not for profit organization called uh, Skitsi. It creatively advocates on behalf of those who have lived with mental health challenges. She's the author last year uh, of a book called uh, My Friend Fox, a memoir. Uh, and, uh, and I was surprised to find that uh, Heidi described herself as a neurodivergent artist. So I am already now at uh, the next cocktail parties I go to to talk at length about uh, what bioethics means. Uh, thank you, Jackie. But Heidi, what is neurodivergence? I've switched the microphone on. <laughs> Tick. Um, thank you. And Roy, it's an absolute power burst to be sitting this close to a story like that. So just acknowledge my gratitude. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I am sitting and standing and feeling gravity on Wurundjeri country. Um, I live and work on Wurundjeri country, but coming here today is Wurundjeri country, but I moved across it. So in coming here, I would have moved through cultural gathering spaces and sacred places and family places and all sorts of places that seem to be covered over with parquetry at the moment. Um, so no, neurodivergence, well, it's about, it, well, you know, a, a, a peer advocate of mine, Prue Stevenson, has said recently that autism and neurodivergent actually is everyone's territory. So everyone here is neurodivergent. We don't experience the day exactly the same as each other. We have different biology, chemistry, experiences, memories, cultures, everything that we will move through this same day with different perceptions. So that's what neurodivergence is. Um, so that, that's great. Go on, Heidi, sorry. <laughs> I hope I answered the question. You did. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've now got two things to talk to people about. <laughs> it, and I really like that. So, so here's the question then that really leads from that. So we're all neurodivergent in our different ways. But I think that your, in a sense, the way you approach evidence is a little bit uh, like Roy, in that you see your own personal experience as something that, you know, is not just yours. It is, if you will, evidence that can contribute to uh, public policy. Is that is that right? Well, <laughs> I find um, public policy a little bit problematic from my point of view because 
um, our lived experience of, of diverse mental health, which includes schizophrenia and bipolar and, and let's just call it complex trauma. Um, we say to the government, we're thirsty, can we have some water? And six years later, the government gives us a glass <laughs> and we're still thirsty. So I think, you know, lived experience um, information to, to policy is a little bit, did somebody say palindrome before? <laughs> It's a bit of a mixed up palindrome. So we give our lived experience and our living experience advice, you know, and that's often um, through a very narrow doorway. And then it goes into governance and policy and research and academia and it gets twisted and tumbled and put over there and put over there and shoved over there and pulled out here. And then it comes back at us and, you know, <laughs> an example of it is recently um, the Victorian government did a royal commission into the mental health system. And when it started, they put a call out for people with lived experience um, of the public mental health system, which is public psych wards and homelessness and all this stuff, for advice on what the new mental health system could, should look like. And... We were given a link to a website and we had to go and register on the website. And then on the website, there were seven building blocks that the government had already predetermined of what a new mental health system would look like. And it was things like suicide prevention, um, better security in psych wards, um, youth prevention of mental health. And so all of us from around the country had to put those seven building blocks in order of our priorities. There was not a single block about the arts, nothing about nature, nothing about culture, cultural diversity, language mode, so nothing about deaf people's language, nothing about disability access, all these things that we've been giving over for the last 20 or 30 years to research and academia and government just didn't come back at us. So I think um, I'm very good at going off on tangents and getting a little bit angry, sorry. <laughs> but it is frustrating. Thank you, Heidi. So look, um, Bridget, I know you're there in the room and uh, I think probably we will end up taking a lot of questions from there. But I did notice, and I might start with you, Brian, there's a good question that has come in on the chat line, which I've been thinking about, and particularly as I've been listening uh, uh, to Heidi and Roy. But I'll put it to you first, because it comes down, is how do you wait? How do you wait different forms and sources of evidence? How do you wait, you know, a... a a significant tome of, you know, social science evidence that you read against, if you will, you know, um, the account of the lived experience of Heidi or Roy? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question, but um, if, if you frame it uh, almost in a judicial way of weighting yeah. the evidence, I think that is a bit of a trap. And I'd prefer to perhaps come around the back of it and say something like, let's talk about our sense of purpose and uh, what, what's, um, what's a, a way of thinking about the medium longer term objectives we're seeking to achieve. And then having had a long talk about that, um, we then talk about, well, uh, who has, um, who has uh, some knowledge and experience that can help us grapple with how we move from where we are now, A, to a better future, you know, B, C, whatever. Um, and then it, it might not be a matter of, um, you know, formal inquiries or, or truth and justice commissions or something like that. It might be yeah. quite purposeful around, um, you know, if there's 100 steps, let's, let's start looking at the first two or three that we can agree need to be attended to and uh, do some combination of 
forums and um, testimony and uh, testing out ideas, but with that sense of purpose. I mean, without that um, strong sense of direction, I think uh, throwing evidence around in various ways becomes um, either ineffectual or just a partisan um, bun fight. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree, Brian. And I think it isn't just about well, how you weight one above the other. It is, I suppose, the context within which you're trying to design and influence uh, the policy. Um, Bridget, have you got questions there in the room? Uh, could I just um, add something to that? Please do. Sorry. Yeah, just to say, I think I was just I, trying I'm to get with, my eyes. All right. I'm with Brian on um, that maybe coming at it from the wrong direction by talking about waiting, um, because you can't, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's apples and tambourines. It's something you can't really compare in the same way. You can't wait. But I think the key is to understand what it is that the different kinds of evidence can offer. What are their strengths? What are their flaws? Um, and not expect one, in a sense, to be better than another, um, but to re take that multi multi pronged approach, and you know, know that that lived experience will give you an insight that external uh, observation, let's say, um, never can. But it's not magic. On the other hand, you know, it still has to be treated critically and and you know, looked at and considered, and so on. So um, that doesn't make the process any easier makes it much more complicated and probably more long-winded but I think ultimately at the end what you come out with is a, a better informed policy. But can I just butt in and add one um, extra thing to Jackie's thoughts that uh, mm. our, our sense of what's valuable about the lived experience is not just a recitation of uh, the facts as we experience them it's also about values and aspiration and where we want to go um, and I think uh, we, we tend to underplay that in our concept of evidence. I think that uh, we need uh, to find some other language to help accommodate that broader range of, of key matters. Yeah. Uh, Bridget, I think I'll over to you in the room for a moment. Uh, yeah, do we have any questions from the room? Oh, yep, we've got one up there. Um, while Camillo's um, going up there, I just wanted to ask um, Roy and Heidi, um, we've talked about the challenges and the um, problems in not incorporating voice and lived experience. How, how would you like to see it be done? What changes would you like to see? Thanks, Bridget. Yeah, look, everyone in this room, if not in the country, can make a huge change in, in terms of the narrative for future generations. How can you develop policy that is going to affect Aboriginal people without lived experience and Aboriginal people influencing that policy? It's crazy. It just don't, it's like me trying to develop policy for women when I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm male, you know, I, I don't know, you know, the, the, that's women's business and you've got men's business. So um, I've got a shirt on. It's the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We're going to a referendum either next year or the year after and we need, we need your support. We need non-Aboriginal Australia you give my mother, you give my mother, my, my mother citizenship rights in '67. I was 10 months old in this country when my mother had a right to vote. Now it's time to give my kids a voice, and we can do that. And I know there's people out there that say, "Oh, why give them special treatment?" Well, it's not special treatment. Policies in this country removed our kids. The trauma that was that was spoken about is intergenerational, transgenerational. But with this process, I think uh, we, we, can, we can start to heal the nation. And we've got to do this together because uh, there are people that are coming through in this country, it's your kids are the ones who are mixing with our kids. 
And they don't see black and white. They don't see racism. They just see their mates. They just see their friends. You know, and it's a narrative, it's a story that we can be part of. And uh, so uh, that's why I'm a staunch advocate for, for trying to bring about change in, ter in terms of letting our people have influence over, a voice over what our future, our, what, what's going to impact on future generations. And I'll just close by saying, Bridget, I can talk about welfare mentality and absolute poverty because I lived it. Lived experience. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. And that's really, really important. I think... Um in terms of mental health and disability, um, we can talk to ourselves every day, all day, week in, week out, year in, year out, and we, we say what we know what we need. Like we know what the challenges are that leads people to live on the streets and end up in the justice system. We know how people end up in public psychiatric wards. And in and out of those places, and you know, it's just a revolving door. We know because, like you say, we've lived it. You know, looking at me, you wouldn't know I've lived on the streets. You wouldn't know that I came from a really dysfunctional place growing up and no access to education whatsoever. Just didn't even, it wasn't really in our constitution, as you might say, <laughs> you know. So it was a trajectory that. I ended up in the public psych system, not running it. So <laughs> there's still time. <laughs> and I think, what can we do to incorporate some of this living experience? I think, you know, the arts, I, I, I don't know if, if politics and the arts will ever mix. I <laughs> I don't know because I think politicians collect art, but I don't know if they make it um, to very different things. But I think artists, you know, they're wounded people by nature and, and the arts is where the healing lies, I think, for a lot of stories and a lot of community. And I, I would love to see this country respect the arts and respect the way we move through nature because... People who, you know, been wounded with trauma, we just know the value of nature. We we just we crave grass and trees. When we're in a psych ward, we're like, can, can we can we get outside for some fresh air? And most psych wards in this country don't have courtyards without people smoking in them. So you know, it's listening to that. Yeah, if I just, um, if I may, Bridget, just a quick point what Heidi was talking about in terms of what she's referring to in our culture is spirituality. And the old fellow, my old mentor said to me, because I was very confused about spirituality and the difference between Christianity and spirituality. And I said, well, Unc, what's spirituality? He said, son, when you're in the river, be the river. When you're at the beach, be the beach. And when you're in the forest, be the forest. And that's what Heidi's talking about. Thank you. That's great. Bridget, I think, I know, in fact, we have run out of time. Oh. I, know, I know that you are going to be able to continue discussions there, uh, I think, after the function. But I wonder whether we now need to draw the uh, hybrid uh, function to an end. I think we are intending to finish at 4.30. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So, so let me, I, I mean, look, I, I have to say it's, uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. We needed another half an hour. I should have said to you beforehand we started, we're going to need another half an hour. I feel frustrated that we're not going to be there with you there in, um, in Melbourne, where I think you can carry on these discussions. But I think it is so good to hear such a diversity of perspectives, which I think all probably sits within under this umbrella of, you know, the, the democratization of evidence. And, you know, it's challenging, 
it presents lots of tricky intellectual problems, but it is, you know, such, I, I think, such an exciting uh, development. But before I hand over to you to wind up, I mean, I just, I want to say for me, I, I want to say on behalf actually of everybody else, I'm sure here, people who like me are time short. What an extraordinarily valuable role the APO has played for 20 years and the, what I hope will be the role that it plays over the next 20 years because it is through the research that you collect, distribute, curate, that people like me, people like I think everybody listening in today, are able to get not just a sense of the just the diversity of research that's going on, the diversity of evidence that's emerging, but the different types of evidence and, and how it is being used. I mean, it is an extraordinary role that the APO plays in terms of, you know, opening up, opening up the evidence, letting us be able to see what work is being undertaken so that we can stop this tendency of, you know, always looking for simple solutions to the complex problems of public policy. Mm. Uh, I found it uh, an extraordinary source. I hope it will continue to be a resource for the next 20 years. And thanks for the opportunity mm. to participate. So yeah, so if everyone could join me in thanking um, Peter, Brian, Heidi, Jackie and Roy um, for speaking today. Uh, we really appreciate it. So And I would just like to thank Swinburne University who have not only hosted this event, but have hosted and supported APO for all of those 20 years. Um, and finally, thanks to...